Okay, module number three in CIS 75. And as every week, I have a little picture. This chapter or this module and the one that follows will focus on cryptography. Uh, it's an introduction into the world of cryptography. The labs will have you do more in-depth things with cryptography, but right off the bat, let me tell you that I am horrible at math. I have always done horrible in math. And uh, cryptography's math scares me. I am not going to force you to know the math behind cryptography. We're going to talk about the methods. We'll talk about the tools that you can use that will do the math for you. But I'm not expecting anybody to pull up a calculator or do any math by hand or anything of that. You have a, you have a calculator in front of you. You have tools that you can use both locally and on the cloud through your browser. Uh, uh, yeah, I do not in any way, shape, or form going to subject you to doing math in this class. This is a math class. This is cybersecurity. So cryptography is an aspect of the cybersecurity realm, just like penetration testing, digital forensics, incident response, packet analysis, malware analysis, web application, and so on. This world, it's definitely its own branch. Uh, I say that because it has its own terminology within it. So for example, uh, steganography, hiding a message within something else. Traditionally, steganography is hiding a message within an image and you take that message, you divide it up within portions of the file that are not used. Anything from the header to the metadata uh, or in areas that contain content itself, you send that picture file out. Nobody thinks anything of a picture file that reaches its destination and then using another tool to get that, that message out and rebuild it and here's the, here's the thing that was sent secretly through a picture. The attack on SolarWinds used DNS packets. They embedded commands within DNS packets and further uh, obfuscated it. So it doesn't have to be putting a message inside a picture, although that's normally what people first think of steganography. It's just taking a message and hiding it within something else so that nobody suspects that you're transferring, whether it's a message or it's data, uh, just through plainly through the internet. Encryption. So steganography is not necessarily encryption because you're just taking a message and dividing it out. Encryption is using math to turn a message into something that no one else can understand unless they know the math to reverse. So the three main terms that go with this are plain text, cipher text, and clear text. Your plain text is the unencrypted input data or the output of a decryption. The cipher text is the scrambled or the unreadable output of encryption. And the clear text is the readable or the unencrypted data being transmitted or stored. Within uh, encryption, we have the algorithm or the cipher. Both terms are used interchangeably. They are the mathematical formulas that use keys or a mathematical value to encrypt or decrypt data. Algorithms function as the locks and utilize unique mathematical values as the key to unlock or lock the data. The oldest of the ciphers is the substitution cipher. 
It is also known as the Caesar cipher, which would take the letter A and move it 13 spaces over. So A would become N, B would become O, and so on. Another cipher is the XOR cipher based on the binary exclusive OR operation. You will take two bits, compare them. If they're different, the answer is one. If they're the same, the answer is zero. So you would take a plain text message with a secret key, XOR the two, and now you have your cipher text and as long as you have that secret key on the other end, you're able to reverse and get whatever the plain text message was. I don't expect you to know this math. I expect you to have an understanding of XOR logic, but I'm not saying you have to be able to do the math. There is an awesome tool that you can wield called CyberChef. It is available through your browser. You don't have to install anything. I would add Cyber, uh, Cyber Chef as an item on your bookmarks. It's an awesome go-to tool. So when you need to do any uh, ciphers like it, uh, it, just go to Cyber Chef and let it do the math for you. The strength of an algorithm depends on several factors. Formulas depend on the quality of their random numbers. Unfortunately, computers are meant to be predictable. Software relies on pseudo random number generators. Attackers use statistical analysis against ciphertext to discover the key to the algorithm. Two factors are diffusion, which is a single plaintext character is changed then multiple ciphertext characters will also change. And confusion, the key does not relate in a simple way to the ciphertext. Eliminating a one-to-one -one correspondence between plaintext and ciphertext allows the plaintext to be diffused across several characters in the ciphertext. Confusion can be slowed by making every ciphertext character depend on several parts of the key forcing the attacker to create the whole key rather than pieces at a time. Uh, we need cryptography in the world of cybersecurity. This should look familiar. It achieves confidentiality by ensuring only authorized parties can view it by using a key. It achieves integrity. Data can only be altered by using the key. If it's altered during transmission, the key won't work and the entire data is corrupted, rendering it safe. Now, just because you can't access the data doesn't mean integrity is lost. We have authentication. The sender has to be authenticated. It'll prevent impersonation. It also achieves uh, non-repudiation is defined as denial, whereas non-repudiation is the inability to deny, and obfuscation. Cryptography hides details, so original message or the code cannot be determined to allow an unauthorized person from reading. Uh, it's basically security through obscurity. Cryptography provides data protection when it is in use by an endpoint or data in use when it is transmitted across the network, which is data in transit, or when it is stored in a medium, data at rest. So this shows us the constraints of cryptography. So yes, cryptography is awesome and necessary, but in order to achieve security with cryptography, you need enough energy. You also need low latency not necessarily always achievable, especially with IoT devices. They tend to be low energy 
or low latency and sacrifice security. So when, if you are a user of IoT, know that for most IoT devices, there's just not enough power to secure them. They, they are unable, physically unable to have enough power and resources to secure communications, therefore leaving them wide open to attacks. Some cryptographic algorithms, starting with a hash. Uh, well, the cryptographic algorithms, uh, the two main are stream and block ciphers. And we'll discuss a number of them coming up. But the first one is hash. It creates a unique digital fingerprint of a set of data. The result of that would be called a digest or a message digest or a hash. Hashes are one way because the purpose is not to create a decryptable ciphertext. Hashing is used for comparison purposes, such as verifying files downloaded completely without alteration. A hashing algorithm is considered secure if it has the following characteristics. A fixed size a digest of a short set of data should produce the same digest of a long set of data. If one occurrence of the letter A produces a hash of 0F34E32F, a million letter A's should produce a hash of A43CBBDE. A hash, the hash length does not change de dependent on uh, the, the amount of data being processed. The hash should always be the same length. It should be unique. Two different sets of data cannot produce the same digest. It should be original. Should not be possible to produce a data set that has a desired or predefined hash. And this should also be secure. The resulting hash cannot be reversed to determine the original plaintext. Now here on this picture are a couple of uh, a couple of these that you should be familiar with, like message digest 5 or MD5, part of the message digest family. It's been around since 89. Um, I have listed in the notes some things that you should know about message digest 5, like uh, the length of a message is padded to 512 bytes. Uh, the algorithm uses four variables of 32 bytes in a round robin fashion. MD5 is not considered secure. You have the secure hash algorithm or SHA. Uh, you have SHA1 that was released in 93, SHA2. Um, we have SHA2 and, and 3 out. We have race, the, uh, the race integrity primitives evaluation message digest. And we have the hash message authentication code. Now, again, you need to know about them, but you don't need to know the math behind them. The CompTIA Security Plus test doesn't tell you, okay, here is a thing, do the math. It's more of compare uh, which, which one of these is MD5? Which one of these is SHA-1? Uh, how long are digests for SHA-1? So symmetric cryptographic algorithms. This is the original of the cryptographic algorithms. They use the same key for both functions for decrypting and encrypting, and are designed to encrypt and decrypt the ciphertext. Since both parties must have the same key, this family is also called uh, the private key cryptography. Symmetric, 
provide protection only if the key is kept secure. Within this family, you have a DES, 3DES, and AES. DES, or the Data Encryption Standard, has been around since the 1970s. It uses a 56-bit key and is totally insecure by today's standards. So somebody thought, well, if DES is no longer secure, let's make it secure by doing the same thing three times. And that's where 3DES comes in or triple DES. That's also not secure. We also have AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. Uh, it, is, it has been brought about by NIST in the late 2000. There's also the RIVEST cipher or RC that has a family of six different algorithms. There is also Blowfish, which is a 64-bit block cipher with a variable keyling, which is kind of unique to others because most of them have a set sized key, whereas Blowfish can be varied. And there's also IDEA, the International Data Encryption Algorithm. That's used in the EU. So the big thing about symmetrics is the sender and receiver have to have the same key. If that key is compromised in any point of the, the communication, then it is all, it's all exposed. The different or the other sibling is asymmetric. This is known as the public key cryptography. Asymmetric uses two keys, which are mathematically related, a public and private. The public key is known to everyone and can be freely distributed. The private key is only known to the individual of whom it belongs. Another way of looking at this is like a mailbox. Anybody can walk up to a mailbox to input something, but only the key holder can open the box to see the contents. In asymmetric, we have more terminology. We have the key pairs. The group uh, requires a pair of keys. We have the public key, like I said, that is designed to be distributed without any protection. And we have the private key, which is kept confidential and never, and never shared. The owner should only have the key. The keys can be used in both ways to encrypt a message with a public key and be able to decrypt with a private key and vice versa. One of the most common algorithms in asymmetric is RSA. In the notes, I gave you a, uh, a step, kind of the steps that it takes to do it. And it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps to do RSA. You take two uh, huge prime numbers chosen at random. They're multiplied together to solve for a variable. Then you have to do a calculation. Uh, then you have to find a number that is not a positive divisor of one of the earlier two. You have another calculation to do and you come out with the public key and private key pairs. You're not expected to know that. You just need to know uh, RSA is one of the more common uh, of the asymmetrics. Elliptic curve cryptography has been around since the 80s using, uh, instead of using prime numbers, it uses sloping curves. The function adds the values of two points on a line and then a third point is derived. Users share one curve and one point on the curve while choosing a secret random number and computes the private key based on the point in the curve. The user's shared public key can generate private keys on the curve. Again, you're not expected to know all the math behind it, but know that 
how it works, that it uses sloping curves across the line and points are chosen on it. And it's mostly used on mobile and wireless devices. Since the keys will be smaller and result in faster computations with lower power consumption. There is also the digital signature algorithm. It's a US federal standard patented under NIST. DSA verifies the sender, provides non repudiation and integrity of the message. Asymmetric, its main purpose is to solve the problem of exchanging keys. It achieves it in four ways. Uh, there's a diffle Hellman. Both parties agree on a, on a large prime number and related integer. Those two numbers can be public, though the mathematical computations to exchange intermediate values, the two parties can create the same key. There's the diffle Hellman ephemeral uses different keys in comparison to the prior. Ephemeral keys are used once and then discarded. You have elliptic curve, Diffel-Hellman, uses the elliptic curve instead of prime numbers, and perfect forward secrecy, public key systems that generate random public keys for each unique session. If the secret key is compromised, the contents will still be safe. working our way through to cryptographic attacks. Because that's the reason why uh, this math has gotten crazier and crazier and crazier. A known ciphertext attack is uh, statistic tools can be used to discover a pattern in the ciphertext used to reveal the plain text or the key. This will require only the ciphertext. You also have things like the downgrade attack. Since most systems are backward compatible, looking at you, Windows, an attacker can force the system to abandon the current higher security mode and fall back to an older, less secure mode using deprecated algorithms, forcing systems to use disapproved algorithms like DES or SHA-1. Improper implementation. Since many algorithms have several configuration options, if they're misconfigured, the system could easily expose their private key or weaken cryptography. And collision attacks, causing a hash function to create the same hash for two different files. Attackers will try all possible combinations until a collision is found, otherwise known as a birthday attack. You can do encryption through software, which is how you are, how you typically use it. For example, pretty good privacy or PGP uses both asymmetric and symmetric cryptography. PGP generates a random symmetric key to encrypt the message. The symmetric key is encrypted with the receiver's public key and sent with the message. PGP will decrypt the symmetric key with the recipient's private key, then use the symmetric key to decrypt the message. You also use it in operating systems, such as the Windows encrypting file system. Apple uses File Vault. Linux uses Lux or the Linux hard disk encryption. Um, you also have Windows BitLocker as part of that group. It's completely transparent to you. The operating system handles the encryption and decryption of files and or of the disks. But you don't get to see any of the math. You just know that it works. There are also hardware encryption. If you haven't seen the iron key, I have provided a link for you in the notes. It is a tamper-proof uh, drive that if somebody tries to open, it will essentially self-destruct. 
and it also has encryption built in. There are also self-encrypting drives. Similar to the iron key, the drive is encrypted at the hardware level to prevent recovery of data or data erasure if the right conditions are met. Like you mistype the password five times so everything is wiped. There is also the trusted platform module, which is what I have pictured here. A dedicated chip for cryptographic purposes like random number generating and testing components at uh, system startup. There are also hardware security modules. Network-based appliances provide security to multiple devices and handle all the math the processing for encryption. Are there any questions? Looking around, looking around. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>